my name is Ellen Brown, and I'm chairman of the Public Banking Institute. Our goal is to get public banks set up all across the country, if possible, a network of public banks. So by public bank, we mean a bank owned by the people through their representative government. So it would be um, a state bank, a city bank, a county bank, or a regional bank, a collection of cities. We've got uh, 25 bills actively being pursued, in, as you see there, and um, over 50 groups that are working on their legislators trying to get bills going. So it's, it's quite an active movement right now. Um, I started writing about public banks after the Wall Street um, crisis in 2008 when um, I knew that North Dakota was the only state that had its own bank. So I was watching it, and it turned out that North Dakota was also the only state that escaped the credit crisis. It had the lowest unemployment rate in the country, the lowest default rate, the lowest foreclosure rate, and it never went in the red. It was always in the black. Um, so, so that so I kept I started writing articles, and that generated a fair amount of interest, quite a bit of interest. And so, in 2011, we started the Public Banking Institute. At the same time, um, Occupy Wall Street was going on, when um, the there was a big movement largely led by young people uh, pointing the finger at Wall Street. So it was not the fault of the subprime borrowers as had been alleged or you know, they, they were getting the blame. So Occupy Wall Street pointed the finger at the right culprits, but they didn't really have a solution. Then, in, uh, then there was the Standing Rock protests, which again brought a lot of people together, uh, particularly young people. And so out of that came a divestment movement. Of course, first the divestment movement was to pull your own um, deposits out of Wall Street banks. But the, then there was a the question, what do you do with our public deposits, our government deposits? And so in Los Angeles and several other cities, there was a push to get the cities to pull their money out of um, particularly Wells Fargo, which was responsible for a lot of these foreclosures that were considered um, fraudulent. So in, in LA, for, I'm from Los Angeles, so in Los Angeles, this largely, a gr group of largely young people persuaded our city council to pull their money out of Wells Fargo. But then, and they passed a resolution saying they would do it, but then the question was, where do you put your money? It would have to be in Chase or some other big Wall Street Bank, because they're the only ones big enough to handle a, city's, a city like Los Angeles's monies. So the, the natural alternative from that was the, um, a public bank. So they formed Public Bank LA. And um, actually, well, actually persuaded the, the uh, city council to, uh, to proceed. And they explored the possibility. And the, the city council just sort of popped, a, popped it on us, a bill, to, uh, to see if the voters wanted a bank, a city-owned bank. So that was in um, a year ago. The, the city brought this bill, and we, we only had like four months to, to, we had no money, and four months to uh, try to generate support for the bill. So it didn't pass, but we got 44% of the vote, and that was pretty good in a city of 4 million, and it did generate a lot of interest. And so out of that, and we, Public Banking Institute, had a retreat where um, we brought activists together from across the country, and so different people in California met, and they formed California Public Banking Alliance, and they brought a bill, AB 857, which carved out a special charter for a publicly owned bank in California. And it was, a, I mean, it was amazing that they won this bill, but they, they did. They got it through both houses of the legislature, um, passed all these big bank lobbyists, and uh, uh, the governor signed it just, uh, just recently. And they managed to get endorsements from 183 organizations, including some big unions and the California Democratic Party. So it was considered a big win. Um, and in the course of that, so our fearless leader in Los Angeles is Trinity Tran. She's a, she was 29 then, 
and uh, you know she wears four inch heels and has the black hair swooped over to one side. I mean she's very very elegant, very dynamic, and very uh, and very strong. And anyway, she was invited to speak at, a, at an event that AOC was giving in Los Angeles to talk about public banking. And so in the course of that, AOC learned about public banking. So she incorporated it in her proposal for uh, a Green New Deal last December. And then it was also in the, in the uh, February bill that, that she and others brought. So in the proposal, it said that funding would be with a combination of the Federal Reserve and a new public bank or system of regional and specialized public banks. And in uh, AOC's bill, it said, a Green New Deal will, will require providing and leveraging in a way that ensures that the public receives appropriate ownership stakes and returns on investment, adequate capital, including through community grants, public banks, and other public financing. So the, the significance of the leveraging part is that if you have a depository bank, you can actually expand the amount of money that you lend. You ex basically can lend 10 times your capital, and I'll get to that. But So that, that was in AOC's bill. So, I, my, so what I want to talk about today, basically, is whether we can fund um, the Green New Deal or any Green New Deal, I know there's a lot of um, the disagreement on whether we should have, whether her bill is good or different things in the bill or whether it's really global warming or global cooling, whether it's really carbon. But what I want, what I want to talk about is whether we can fund it. Whatever Congress decides they want to do, do they have the money? And the, you know, the big pushback is that we just can't afford it. So her bill, the February bill, said that it would include 100% renewables, that we would upgrade all existing buildings, expand high-speed rail, clean, have clean, provide clean air and water for all. But it also included the big ticket items were the economic prosperity and security for all. So that would be a jobs guarantee for everyone, um, universal health care, maybe a universal basic income. And those are the ones particularly that it is said we can't afford, but I will argue that we actually can afford it, that we can afford a lot more than we think we can. So this is just a typical uh, conservative think tank says that we can't possibly afford all this because they came up with figures that were close to $100 trillion. But you'll notice, so they, they include a low-carbon low electricity grid, net zero emissions, transportation system, and then the, the um, social, social things as well. But they omit what we at this conference think is the real solution and the most cost-effective solution uh, in uh, a bestseller called Project uh, Drawdown by Paul Hawken. He went through a hundred different solutions for um, for uh, fixing the economic crisis, however you want to define it. And among those, they were surprised themselves at the results. It was not what you would think. It was not uh, changing over the transportation system to Priuses and electric cars. It was not redoing all the buildings or redesigning all the cities. It was not even. Um, electricity generation, it was food, the category of food. So in that category, they, that included how you grow your food, how you um, transport your, or market your food, and how you use your food. And of those 100, 30 of them were in this, uh, of the top 30 out of those 100, 12 were in the, in the food sector of the sort that have been discussed here, that basically the regenerative agriculture. So silvopasture, regenerative agriculture, tropical staple trees, conservation agriculture, tree intercropping, managed grazing, farmland restoration, multi-strata agroforestry. So those are all things that, um, I mean, <laughs> you all know already after this. Uh, that uh, nature is the best carbon sequester. And nature's been working on this for hundreds of millions of years, and there are numerous studies that say so. For example, there was a recent study in science that said a worldwide tree planting program could remove two-thirds of human carbon emissions. 
There's another study that said grasslands, just plant, planting grasses of various sorts, actually worked better than trees. And another one that said that uh, hemp was better than grasses. So I mean, those are just that's just a random sample of what you can do with with plants. Um, and meanwhile, we have this factory farming that actually is a major contributor to the environmental crisis. That I think the official figures are something like 11% of carbon debt, but when you include all the externalities, I saw one study that it could be as much as 50% was the result of factory farming and you know big ag, basically. Uh, so that's just the carbon problem. And then there's the fact that we're getting bad food, so we're getting sick off of it. So that drives up our medical costs. So if we could fix that, we would obviously reduce our medical costs. And then there's the moral issue of the inhumane treatment of billions of animals. So these, the big ag, is what's getting subsidized right now. They are getting $20 billion annually in subsidies. So that would be um, an obvious first source of funding just to switch those subsidies over to paying farmers as not a subsidy, but to actually compensate them for their, now there are different devices where you can measure um, how much carbon has been sequestered in your soil. And of course there's um, Dan's uh, device that can tell how much, what the nutrient content is in different foods. So you could actually quantify how much farmers had done in the way of regenerative ag agriculture and compensate them accordingly. So, th so that actually is not all that expensive. I mean, I think you could probably fix the whole environmental problem or the mass of the most of the environmental problem just by changing our agricultural methods. And if you can persuade farmers to do it, which would be another expense, of course, an educational program, if you can persuade them to do it, they'll actually make more money in the end. So they would actually, it would be in their best interest to do it, and it would be in our best interest. I mean, it's not just, I saw in that movie that they showed here on fr Friday, I think it was, there was one line where the man said, all we hear about is austerity, you know, tightening our belts, we're going to have to give up this and give up that. But what about all the things we're going to gain? We'll get healthy food, you know, it'll taste better, we'll feel better, we'll get clean air, we'll get clean water. So um, we'll get, <laughs> so we'll get many benefits out of this program. It's not just a matter of cleaning up the, cleaning the carbon out of the air. But so that leaves the big ticket items. And that's what I want to argue that we could do those as well. Obviously, I, so yesterday I talked all about, um, the nuts and bolts of money and banking and um, went into this in more detail, but I'm, I'm going to summarize a bit. Obviously, we could pay for the whole thing just through quantitative easing from the Fed. I mean, the Fed can just issue the money. The Congress would have to change the Federal Reserve Act. They're not actually allowed to do that right now, but it could be done. Congress passed the Federal Reserve Act in the first place, and they do amend it periodically. So it could be changed to allow for a form of quantitative easing for the people. So that would be, you, you wouldn't have to raise taxes, you wouldn't have to do, uh, you know, tap up the rich, although that might not be a bad idea either. But anyway, you wouldn't have to do that because you know that's where you're gonna get your pushback, that they're not, that Congress is not gonna approve if it means that they're gonna have to pay themselves. The objection to that is that it would be inflationary, that you're going to have too, too much money chasing too few goods, and that will just drive up the prices without doing anything for productivity. That's called the quantity theory of money. But that's not actually true, as I will show. First of all, we actually need more money in the economy. The, the consumer economy is chronically short of money. You can tell from this chart um, the money supply is the green blocks and the red are, is debt, household, business, and government debt. And the debt is going up faster than the money supply and it obviously way outstrips the money supply. So in order to pay off all those debts, you need more money in the system. And it used to be during um, ancient times in Mesopotamian, ancient Mesopotamia, 
they fixed the problem with debt jubilees that because the king was the, the creditor, the king ch could just relieve the, uh, forgive the debts and um, let, the work, let, let the serfs get out of jail, out of debtor's prison, and go back to work on the land, which is where the king wanted them anyway. But today, the lenders are private, and we won't be able to persuade persuade them to just write the debts off on their books. So the other alternative is put more money in the system, and it seems to be the fairest way to do that is with the universal basic income. Um, and just to getting back to the nuts and bolts of money, um, most of our money is created as bank, bank debt, and this is... Uh, it used to be controversial, but the Bank of England just came out and said it in 2014. They said in their quarterly report, contrary to popular belief, banks do not act simply as intermediaries lending out deposits that savers place with them. Commercial banks actually create money in the form of bank deposits by making new loans. In fact, they said bank deposits make up 97% of the amount of money currently in circulation. So banks are creating our money and... The problem is, one problem is that they create the principal but not the interest. So there is always more money ba owed back in the whole system than was created in the original loans. And so that means it's basically a pyramid scheme. You have to keep getting more and more credit uh, borrowers uh, in, coming in through the bottom to support the uh, top of the pyramid, the creditors at the top. And the result is credit booms and busts. When people are all borrowed up and they can't borrow anymore, then they start paying down their debt and money is created as a loan. It's extinguished when it's paid off. So when the debts are paid off, the money supply shrinks and that's called debt deflation, which is quite dangerous. It sort of feeds on itself. Um, and every time we have a collapse, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer because the people who have money to spend, to buy up the, the assets at fire sale pr prices and um, rent them back to the poor at inflated prices. So the gap widens, the, the wealth gap widens and the debt to income gap widens. So there's less and less income to pay off the debts. So that is called debt deflation where um, <clears throat> you have falling demand because people don't don't have an, the money to spend, and that means the businesses don't have, can't sell their products, so then they lay people off, and then there are more people that don't have money to spend. Their bankruptcies, falling tax revenues, uh, and debts go up, and it, it just feeds on itself, and that's what happened in the Great Depression. So that's what, what even the Federal Reserve is really worried about. They do not want that to happen. So if we can't fill the gap with the debt jubilee, what can we do? Um, ben Bernanke said in 2002 when he was advising the Japanese, he said it's easy to fix the debt deflation. You just fly over the people with helicopters and, and drop money on the people. And he got that from, from Milton Friedman. It was just a, you know, sort of a tongue-in-cheek image. But all you have to do, in other words, is fill the gap with some extra money. And everybody, of course, said you can't do that because it'll be inflationary. But you can do it. You can, everybody agrees, actually, that you can do it up to the point of full employment because if, if the money is directed into the real economy so that it actually produces new goods and services. So if you have, um, this is just my little uh, model, if you have $100, Chasing a hundred widget, the price will be a dollar. If you have a thousand dollars chasing a hundred widget, it will drive up the price. So you will, it will go up to ten dollars. But if you have a thousand widgets chasing a thousand, a thousand dollars chasing a thousand widgets, the price will be a dollar. So prices remain stable up to full employment at least, but it, they actually stay remain stable quite a bit beyond that. Um, the, I went through these yesterday, but um, China actually increased their money supply by 1,800% in the last 23 three years. So in other words, they, it's 18 times what it was 23 years ago, which you would say that must cause hyperinflation. But in fact, their consumer price index, this, the bottom chart, has basically remained stable. It's had some little ups and downs, but it's the same place now that it was in 1998, around 2%, a little over 2%. 
And the reason is their GDP went up at the same rate. So they were pumping all this money into producing products. Uh, we had a similar situation in the Civil War. This is really the only time we've tried this in, in, since we've been a country. We did it, of course, as in colonial times, just printed the money. But uh, Abraham Lincoln doubled the money supply with greenbacks, just paper receipts for money instead of gold back money, and uh, succeeded in winning the war and in uh, generating quite a bit of productivity. It was a very productive period in our history including um, building the Transcontinental Railroad, which connected both ends of the country together. And in the course of all that, the government turned a 60% profit on money that they just printed in the first place. So um, it's very similar to what the Chinese do, but uh, the Chinese have done it even better because they own their banks and they can issue credit at will. So, and this is a chart of the inflation rate all through the, from 1665. You can see that it remained level all the way up to about 19, in the 1970s and, or the 1980s. And that's when uh, there was a liberalization and, of the regulations. In other words, the banks were allowed to do whatever they wanted and they, they were issuing credit like crazy, but for spe speculative things. Oops. So then there's a, the, the objection that you can only do it up to full employment and that we're already there, which technically, supposedly, we're already at full employment. But uh, according to the, those figures, leave out the people that have quit looking for work, according to John Williams of shadowstats.com, on a real unemployment is 22%. But besides that, there is the fact that when you, when you increase the money supply, all that money is not going to go for consumer goods. People who have debts will pay down their debts, and people who um, who don't need the money won't probably won't go in the consumer market either. They don't need another watch or another cell phone or whatever, so they will probably put it into investments, which is a totally different market. It's the, um, Michael Hudson wrote a book um, about basically how it was a parasitic. The, you, we've got two economies, really. The, the speculative economy is this sort of parasite that feeds on the real economy. And it's really, it draws money out, and the money doesn't go back. It just keeps driving up the price in the speculative economy. But, and in China, the Chinese are, very, are big savers. And uh, when, they, when their incomes went up, they did not rush out and spend the money. They saved it. And so consumer spending as a share of GDP went down as their, as their, um, as their GDP went up. In the US, savings rates are very low. 40% of the population can't come up with $400 in, a, in an emergency. So those people will not be rushing out <coughs> to buy trinkets, if they get a windfall, they will, they will use that money to build up their savings, you can assume, or to pay down their debts. And in fact, oops, and in fact, you can make it mandatory that they pay down their debts. In other words, a UBI, a universal basic income, could go right into their bank accounts. Their bank knows what debts they have. It could just automatically pay off, like their credit card and their student debt, et cetera. And money that if money is created as a loan, it's extinguished when the loans are paid off. So that money would just disappear. It would not go into the, you know, it wouldn't be driving up consumer prices. And we're at higher debt levels than we've ever been before. So 80% of, 80 of Americans are now actually have to borrow to meet, just to meet expenses. That's not counting like for their house. It means for their monthly expenses, they have to borrow. And how much do they have to borrow? Um, $15,000 per capita per year. So, so let's assume that we gave a UBI of $1,000 a month. So that's not even up to the 15000 that they have to borrow. And you know that debt is driving up these charts. It's driving up the, the debt versus the, the money available to repay it. So 80% of re recipients 
would be using their, if, if it were made automatic, 80% would be using their UBI to pay down their debts. So that money would just disappear along with the debt. And as for the other 20%, they don't need the money either. So they're not going to be rushing into the consumer market. They're probably going to, whatever, buy some form of investment with it. So overall, on balance, it's not going to do much at all to this consumer price index and to the to the extent that it does go into the consumer market, it will be good because we need more money out there to stimulate um, stimulate productivity. So instead, the money created as debt would just be replaced with debt-free money created as people's quantitative easing. This chart is from a great little French video. Um, so that the one the one um, bathtub the private bathtub is the bathtub from money created by private banks is where we're getting our money now. So that spigot would just be turned off and the other spigot would be turned back on, which the other spigot is where we should have been getting our money and we're getting our money actually before the 1970s. But I went and tell that yesterday. So, so um, that's one alternative is to go to the Federal Reserve for quantitative easing type, you know, just to tap into their bottomless pit of money, bottomless well of money. But there are other options at the federal level as well. One would be to restore postal banking. We actually had postal banking from 1911 to 1967. The postal bank was set up before the Federal Reserve and it was very popular. Um, people got, it paid 2% interest for your deposits. It was very safe and it was particularly popular during the 1930s. Everybody rushed to put their money into the postal banks when the private commercial banks were, were bankrupt. Uh, but the, the banks obviously saw this as a problem, so they leaned on Roosevelt. Instead of supporting the postal banking system and making it bigger and giving it more uh, capacity, what the government did was to give FDIC insurance to the private banks. So now the government was deposit uh, was guaranteeing the private deposits in uh, private banks. So we the people are basically guaranteeing our own deposits. Um, so in 1967, after the government just gradually pulled back, or sort of circumscribed the postal banks so that they couldn't do as much as the commercial banks, and eventually they were shut down on the theory that this was uh, something that we needed in an emergency, and the emergency was over, so we didn't need it anymore. But there is a movement now to restore the postal banks. Uh, Senator Kirsten Gillibrand, Gillibrand um, has a banking bill that was filed in 2018, and uh, Bernie Sanders and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez are pushing that idea in their Loan Shark Prevention Act that was filed this year. 25% uh, of the population is unbanked or underbanked, and they are paying, I saw one study where they're paying about $40,000 a year over the course of a, of, a, of a full, you know, whatever, 40 years, um, just in deposit and checking fees. That's not counting interest, but just to have the benefits of being able to write checks and have your, have your deposits be secure in a bank. So that could be avoided. And then the 400% um, interest rates on payday loans, they, they could cut that way down. I saw one study, they could, they could cut it down to something like 28%, which is, still sounds a bit high, but it's not nearly as high as 400%. And these are risky borrowers, so you've got to have enough to cover the, the defaults that you can anticipate you'll probably have. Another federal option is a federal development bank. Many countries have these development banks. Uh, Germany has one. China, of course, has a couple. Um, Asian countries in general have them. Latin American countries have them. And we had a, an, an excellent model in the 30s. Roosevelt tried to get the, the uh, Federal Reserve to set up a system of 12 industrial banks, but Congress wouldn't do it. So instead, he used the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, which was uh, uh, set up by Hoover before him, uh, actually to serve the banks. But Roosevelt vastly expanded what it could do. So it was really, um, they, 
the bank issued loans or issued bonds and uh, sold them, and it was most of the bonds were bought by the treasure by the U.S. Treasury, so it was still basically government issued money. And uh, in the court, it started out with a mere uh, $500 million in capitalization, and over the course of 25 years, it um, loaned or invested over $40 billion. So it rebuilt the whole country and fun funded World War II and turned a profit on all that of um, seven, about $700 million for the government. So, so it was making below market loans to businesses that couldn't otherwise get loans. What they funded were called self-funding loans, the type of thing that would pay back. So railroads where you, where you get the fees, or uh, you, um, power companies where you could charge fees for the power, or farms that were productive, um, all that type of thing would be funded by the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. So basically what you're doing is just extending credit, which we, the government, sh or our government should be able to do, and the credit um, generates some sort of productivity, and then the fees from whatever you produced pays back the loan, and that's the way money really should work, instead of having to go to someone that's got the money and, um, but, you know, our current system, which, which is based on this whole, even though we don't, no longer have gold in the system, it's based on the idea that money is a thing and that you have to get it from somewhere else. But really, money is just credit. Banks themselves are just issuing credit. The government could be doing that. In Germany, uh, Germany has uh, KFW is a very big uh, development bank that is owned by the German government. And between that, half of, uh, half of the German banking assets are in the public sector. So they have this network of sparkasm banks that serve just local communities. They're not allowed to go outside their local community. And between them and KFW, they managed to fund, uh, provide over 72% of the financing for uh, Germany's transition into what is now called the world's first major energy economy, where they switched over to renewables. Um, so that by 2017, uh, 41% of their electricity was in renewables, up from 6% in 2000. And the, the, um, the public banks not only provided funding, but they, they actually worked with the, the um, producers that coordinated, coordinated the whole project, these green projects. And in China, we, China owned, in 2010, when China basically saved the global economy, um, they owned 60% of their, or no, I think they owned 80% of their, their banks were publicly owned. Now it's down to about half, but even so, the, the government owns the big development banks, the big important banks. So, so banks, like all banks, they could just issue credit, um, create credit on their books, and lend it to these various companies. Uh, for example, they built 12,000 miles of high-speed high rail in a decade, and they have the world's largest dam and power station, among many other developments that are all funded just with credit issued by their own banks. They issue the credit, the fees from the thing pay back the loan. And if, if the, so they invest in what looks like a good credit risk, but if these little businesses don't uh, make it, if they go bankrupt, the government doesn't put them into bankruptcy, and they don't put the bank into bankruptcy. They just carry the loans or write off the loans or bury them in these um, off, book, off the books. And we in the West complain that this is not fair, that they're subsidizing their industries, and that uh, they have these high non-performing loans, and that you know they're the banks are going to go bankrupt. But they're not. The banks will only go bankrupt if the government decides to put them into bankruptcy. And as we have seen, we actually need extra money in the economy. So that money from defaults is just money that was created that was never pulled back. And that's good for the economy. So it's working for them, and their banks are not actually on the verge of collapse, as everybody seems to think. So that's what we could do on the federal level. 
But if we can't do that, there's a, we can do it at the local level because banks create money in the process of making loans. We could set up our own public banks that do that. And by cutting out the middleman, we can do it much more cheaply than private banks. And we can then make below market loans into the local community. We can direct the money where we want it to go. We can avoid having it go into things that not only don't help our community, that, but may actually be, be hurting our community. That's something that's really important to these millennials that are, that are pushing for public banks in their cities right now. The, uh, the American colonists developed the first good public banking model uh, in colonial P Pennsylvania. That was Benjamin Franklin's uh, colony, of course. The government set up a public bank, a public land bank, that would, instead of just issuing money like the other colonies were doing, which tended to be inflationary because it was hard to pull them back in taxes, the Pennsylvania colony uh, lent, issued and lent the money. And then they could issue a little extra that would be enough to cover the interest. So for example, they could print $105, lend 100 at 5% interest, spend $5 on things the community needed, and then there would be $105 out there. There would be enough money out there to pay principal and interest. They could lend, it would come back to the government. They could lend the same 100, spend the same five, and it would all come back again. So it's a sustainable system. It wouldn't have to keep expanding and expanding to cover the interest. So during that time, they paid no taxes except an excess tax on liquor. They did not have price inflation, and there was no government debt. A very good system until the king <laughs> shut it down, which was one of the major triggers of the revolution. Globally, 25% of banks are publicly owned, including the lar world's largest banks. Uh, the two largest banks by market capitalization are in China, the largest bank by deposits. Uh, Japan Post Bank, it's now been partially privatized but it is the largest bank by deposits. Largest bank by number of branches is in India. Largest development bank is China Development Bank. And then the world's seven safest banks are publicly owned, led by KFW in Germany. Yes? How did they create money? How do you go into that? I did go into that yesterday, but OK. So banks create money by. Um, uh, they, it's called double entry bookkeeping. So when they when they make a loan, let's say it's a loan for five hundred thousand dollars to buy a house. No, I understand that, but, it, but that's part of the national system of money. How does a loan get paid? Oh, they would do they would do the same thing, but you've cut out the middlemen. So you don't no bonuses, fees, commissions, no shareholders. You don't have to focus on short term profits. You can look on look over the, you know, what's good for the community over the long term. US dollars. Oh yeah, US dollars. Yeah, no, I'm talking about a government owned bank as opposed to not a, not a community currency type thing. I mean, I would argue that a state could issue their own community currency. I mean, California did it in the form of warrants, but it's in the constitution that they can't, of course. But maybe a local community could do it, or a county, or something. But on the sort of how um, I feel like we spend so much money outside of our communities, or so many businesses, local businesses, or not local businesses, like if it's Walmart or Target or Amazon or whatever. So does that affect like the money staying in the local economy? <coughs> if it's, you know. Um, well, what, I mean, they're all different models. I'll get to what the Bank of North Dakota does. But for example, what we were, we had, we had a bill, we have a bill on right now in California to turn the California Infrastructure and Development Bank into a, a depository bank, which would allow it, to, I'll go into that, but allow it to expand um, the amount of loans it can make. And it makes specifically loans for infrastructure and development targeted to the local community. So it's not going to be a loan to Walmart or you know a big foreign owned company. 
But you can target it, how, you know, you can design it however you want. And that's one advantage of a, lo of a local bank is you want to make sure that you've got local people on the board, rep you know, representing the local community and what the community wants and the type of loans that they want to make and what they want to do with the profits. What, for example, some things just aren't going to be profitable. You, you don't want to make loans to homeless people because they're probably not going to pay it back. But you could use your profits from a bank that makes loans to small businesses to help the homeless. You know, you can include that in your program. Um, globally, public banks avert banking crises because they, when the private banks are afraid to lend because of conditions, the public banks get out there and lend more. And that's what happened in China. That's why China managed to pull the global depression, you know, turn the global depression around in tw around 2010, where they just pumped money into the, out into the economy for productive purposes. And you can see in all these different countries, the um, private banks are the yellow on the left, and the public banks are the blue on the right. And uh, the public banks really pumped it out during the collapse of 2008 and 2009. Uh, public banks are also the heavy hitters in climate finance, so they control 20% of ac assets globally, but they, which is a lot. I mean, there's, public banks have a lot of money that they can do things like a Green New Deal for if we can get the world together to agree on what we want to, what kind of remedies we want to do for a Green New Deal. And I would, of course, argue that what we want to do is. Um, regenerative agriculture, that that's the most cost-effective thing to do. But if you can get a, them together, they control 20% of ac assets, assets being like money or loans, and, um, but they, they contribute nearly 50% uh, of the money going to climate finance, and this is because private banks have their, their goal on short-term profits. They're not interested as a, I mean, their business model is to make as much money as they can for their shareholders, short term. So they don't have their eye on saving the planet. They have their eye on making money. Um, now I just have a quote here from Thomas Marois, who is, uh, he's written a lot on public banking. Uh, he's at the University of London. He says, private finance has no appetite for saving the planet without first feeding insatiable shareholders. So it, it almost has to be the public banks that do it because you're not just not going to get the private sector to do it. The things they're interested in are things that pay 10% return or whatever, and those things are not going to be rebuilding, rebuilding things. Or you know, actually, regenerative <laughs> agriculture might give a good. I hadn't thought that through, but they might give a good return. But it's anyway. We want the public banks in there, and they do have the assets to do it. So recent studies have shown that public banks are also safer, less corrupt. This is contrary to popular belief, because most people think it's the other way. More profitable, and they avert banking crises by lending counter-cyclically, and they obviously serve local economies rather than private investors. So our one and only, oh, yeah. Oh, I was just curious on that last slide, um, that like I was telling somebody about your presentation yesterday and that was one of the like big things they said, oh, but the countries have a lot of corruption like and public banks, they can dip into all that money, that's why we don't do that here. So could, could you just talk about that for a second, whether that's actually true or... Well, the... Mm -hmm. Public banks did have a bad reputation right up till the... the banking crisis, and then it became obvious that it was the private banks that were, were the most corrupt, and it was the public banks that actually saved different countries that had them. In India, for example, the public banks were criticized as being not exactly corrupt, but, you know, they have people that they keep on for life, and they're, maybe they don't work so hard or whatever, that kind of thing. But really, the Indian banks are designed to help the local people, the local farmers, and those loans just don't make all that much money. I mean, they're not losers, but but it became the thing in the 90s to invest in the private banks because they were supposedly the big profit makers. 
Um, but you can design your bank. Of course, in a, maybe if you're an African country and not a lot of, I mean, you could imagine corruption happening, but you can design your bank. Now we've got virtually the ability to uh, have full transparency and full accountability. You know, we've got all that on the internet. You could design it so that anybody who wanted to see what was going on could look on the internet. And at least, I mean, if, J if um, Jamie Diamond is doing something corrupt, what can we do to stop him? I mean, that's his, that's, he's allowed to do it. But a public bank, uh, first of all, you're not going to have pol politicians running it. You're going to have seasoned bank, you know, just loan officers. The California Infrastructure and Development Bank has loan officers that have been making very safe, prudent, um, profitable loans for 15 years ever th since it was set up. So it's not like um, public servants can't do just as good of a job as a private bank, but the public servants are uh, can be fired for not uh, serving the public interest, and particularly the politicians who, whatever, who appoint them can be fired. So their you know their jobs they they have a vested interest in doing a good job for the public. So North Dakota is our one and only publicly owned bank, uh, or it has been for the last hundred years. And now we have the Bank of American Samoa, but American Samoa is not a state, so it's offshore. But, but anyway, they did manage to set up a bank that just got going this year. They, it took them two years to get a license from, or to get a master account from the Federal Reserve, because uh, supposedly, I guess, the Federal Reserve was reluctant to establish this precedent. <laughs> but, but they did, so now we have a precedent. Um, so uh, the Bank of North Dakota has done brilliantly well. They were set up in 1919 by a, it was a farmer's movement that farmers were losing their farms to out-of-state bankers and they got together, formed the Nonpartisan League and won an election and set up their own bank. And it's been doing brilliantly well, even though their mandate is not to make a profit. The mandate is actually to serve the public to, to serve the local community. But according to the Wall Street Journal in a November 2014 article, the, the Bank of North Dakota is actually more profitable than Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan Chase with um, a return on equity of close to 19%. Yeah, they, they make loans in this, but they, they're using their own deposits, leveraging their own capital, backed by their own deposits. They've got massive deposits. I mean, what we do now is send our deposits off to Wall Street, and they leverage them for their own purposes. They're not, they're not returning the benefit to us, and in fact, they're often hurting us with the types of investments they make. Yeah. So, so we're just, it's sort of like beating them at their own game. I mean, we're just taking the model and saying, well, we've seen what you can do with this model. Now we want to use it to serve the public interest. But you really do need to, a, a way to make money, you know, to expand the money supply. If you don't, you, then you wind up with deflation, which closes in on itself. That's what happened down in the gold standard. Um, all through the 19th century, there were bank runs because the banks just didn't have enough gold. So the Bank of North Dakota in 2019 uh, had total assets of $7 billion, uh, capital of $861 million, and a return on equity of 18%. So they've been had record profits year after year for the last eight, 15 years. That, that, that one article in 2014 said it was because of oil. But right after that, they had a big oil bust. And the state itself, actually, for the first time since 2002 with the dot-com bust, it was for the first time, they went in the red. And what they did at both of those occasions was just issue an extra dividend from their own state-owned bank and got themselves out of the red. So instead of having to have a rainy day fund where you set money aside just for a rainy day, you can draw on your own bank. Uh, and in the meantime, it's operating as a bank. So if it wasn't about oil, why was it so profitable? It's, it's, it's the business model. Uh, no private shareholders, no bonuses, fees, or commissions, no high-paid CEOs. 
uh, they don't have to advertise. By law, all of the state's deposits are deposited in the Bank of North Dakota and the cities as well if they want to deposit in the, in the Bank of North Dakota. Um, and they don't have to advertise for borrowers either because they actually partner with the local banks rather than competing with them. And the, so the local banks come to them if they need help, like with the loan they want to. There's a loan that they can't take on themselves, then uh, Bank of North Dakota might buy down 90% of the loan, you know, put up the liquidity, put up the, the deposits, basically, to cover the loan. And um, so, so it's, the, it's as if the local banks are the front office, and then the Bank of North Dakota is, is more like a banker's bank providing capital, providing liquidity, and providing, they also help with uh, all these regulations that are, that are forcing small banks in other states to, uh, to merge with the big banks because they just can't afford the regulations. Uh, North Dakota actually has six times as many local banks as any other state. Yes? Um, can you just repeat again, like, so how does, how does it have no branches in ATMs? It's basically... Well, there, there's money in the local banks, not the local banks. Yeah, so so they don't take individual deposits. So if you're you would be banking with your local city bank, and then the Bank of North Dakota is just using the assets of the state to provide liquidity to or to provide capital to these local banks when asked. They don't even. It, it's actually the local bank that initiates the deal. The, the, state, the Bank of North Dakota is allowed to make uh, direct loans in areas where the, there's no local bank doing it, like there were some remote areas where there was nobody to, for farmers to borrow from, and then the, um, you know, the Bank of North Dakota could go in there. And they, they did have a big student loan program, but they've cut back on that now because the feds have taken it over. So it's not just the Bank of North Dakota. The, uh, the Sparkasm banks also are more profitable than the local private banks, um, and they pay more taxes. So they're, they're, good, they're very popular with the, you know, all the local regions. So when, when we would, we've had a lot of experience now going to local legislators, and they will typically say, well, we don't need more banks. We've already got lots of banks, and, um, and we've already got loan funds that are already making the kind of loans you're talking about. So what do we need these banks for? But the difference is uh, a loan fund, the difference between a loan fund and a depository bank is, you, is leverage. You can make many times more loans with the same capital, which I'll get into. And um, the private banks, of course, we've got them, but they're, they're very expensive and they're not making the kind of loans we want. They're not using their profits for our benefit in our local communities. In California, there are school districts, particularly like in Orange County, that are paying over three times principal on these capital appreciation bonds just because they have no other, so there's no other place they can get money. So they're paying exorbitant rates to, uh, largely to Goldman Sachs. Um, and then if, the, if a city doesn't have the money and they need to do some sort of development, then they, they wind up selling off their public assets. And so we, the people, are still paying the cost. Like, we're paying these high tolls and high fees for parking or whatever. It's just the government gets off the hook, but then the local people wind up paying even more than if the government had found some other way to fund their projects. And then there's the bank fees themselves. In Los Angeles, there was a study several years ago that showed that the city of Los Angeles actually pays more on Wall Street fees. These are just fees, not interest. Just the fees for you know, doing banking than it did on, the, um, on repairing the, ro the roads, which it uh, needs. <laughs> the ro roads are not in good shape in Los Angeles. So a major factor is the interest. If you, if you fund something with bonds over a long period of time, uh, it's half the cost of in infrastructure is interest. And here are a couple of examples. The Bay Bridge retrofit was supposed to be $6 billion. The, the, What they put out to the, to the voters was that this was a $6 billion bill. 
but by the time it's paid off, it'll be another six billion or 12 billion total. The bullet train was supposed to be about 10 billion, and by the time they add in interest, just for that portion of the bullet train, it'll be close to 20 billion. So this is what you could do. This is the iBank, the Infrastructure and Development Bank that we have a bill about <laughs> that uh, has gotten stalled in committee, as they tend to do. It's, it's in suspense, as they say. Um, but I, th I think it's a very good idea. It's actually it, that Infrastructure and Development Bank has $400 million that, that it was allocated by the, by the legislature 15 years ago as a loan fund. So that's money belonging to the bank, and, but it's not a real depository bank. It's just a loan fund. So it lends money out at 3%. Waits for it to come back, lends it out again. That's how a loan fund works. But if it were a depository bank, it could lend four billion. It could lend ten times that. If you called that four hundred million capital, then you can um, lend ten times as much. You you would have caught. I mean, you would think to look at that, you would think, well, that means we make thirty percent instead of three percent. But of course, you're going to have costs. So it's not going to it's not going to come out quite that high. I, what, when I ran through all the numbers, I got that it really only got a 7% return on equity instead of 3%. Um, but that's still more than double. And meanwhile, what you've done is made 10 times as many below market loans. There is like 20 times as much demand for these loans as there is capacity to make them. There are all kinds of little local businesses that want these loans. And they, I mean, nobody can borrow at 3% these days. I have a friend who has a small business, and he used to have a credit line at 8%. And he needs that credit line, you know, to pay his workers and materials before he has a product, before that, whatever, 30 days, 60 days net, or whatever, when, they, when he gets paid. And that's just the way the business operates. And they cut off his credit line after 2008 and now he has to borrow on a credit card, so that's like 17%. So businesses are really struggling for loans, and we could leverage our own capital to make, to vastly expand their ability to get them. And it's these small businesses that do most of the uh, hiring, uh, you know, new, new uh, employment comes from the small businesses. So we really need that to stimulate the economy. Another, this is another example. A year ago in California, we passed a water bond that was supposed to be $4 billion. Again, that's what the voter looks, like, looks at, and they think it's a $4 billion bond. But in the fine print, it's payable at 4% over 40 years. So by the time you're done, it's an $8 billion bond. You're doubling the price. Uh, but if you paid it at 3%, like let's say you just funded it through the Infrastructure and Development Bank, at 3%, you could pay it off in 30 years, so you could save half the cost of financing or a quarter of the cost of the, of the bond. And that's just assuming paying it out over 40 years. But if you borrow from a bank on a credit line rather than... Um, on a bond where you're paying every, every year, regardless of whether you use the money, then you only have to pay as you go. Like you only borrow for this part of the project that you're doing this year. So you save a lot more than, than you know, a quarter over the whole, projected over the whole thing. Uh, in California, we have a, uh, now have passed legislation that says we're supposed to have 100% renewables by 2045, and the projected cost is $350 billion. So this is money that we don't have. Where are we going to get it? So if, we, if you funded it through the Infrastructure and Development Bank at just 3% instead of 4%, and I think bonds are now going up higher than 4%, um, you could save 25% of that or $90 billion, and you could save a lot more if you're funding it on a credit line, you know, bit by bit as you go, pay as you go. So after 2008, which what I think is the positive part of this whole credit collapse is that the central bank has shown us what they can, what they can do. The central banks globally, they've shown us that they can make zero interest rate loans to banks. They can issue trillions of dollars in quantitative easing to banks. Um, they, they pay 2% interest, or now I think it's down to 1.8% interest 
two banks on these excess deposits, of which there are one and a half trillion, which the banks got as a result of quantitative easing. And some central banks are actually buying stock. The Swiss central bank is buying the big fang stocks, you know, is, uh, what is it, like Amazon, Apple, whatever, Netflix, I forget, Google, what's the F, I forget. Um, and um, in Japan, they're buying ETFs, exchange traded funds, so they're like buying stocks across the board. But anyway, they're buying stocks, they're investing in actual companies. So if we could capture the Federal Reserve, get it back as an entity that's actually serving the people, um, we could be issuing interest-free loans to state banks. That, that was actually proposed by President Obama in 2010, around then, and uh, um, Ben Bernanke said they couldn't do it because it wasn't in the Federal Reserve Act. They're not allowed to make, they're allowed to make zero interest loans to banks, but they can't make zero interest loans to states, which there's no reason for that other than the fact that it was basically the bankers that wrote the act. So we could change that. We could uh, do people's quantitative easing, where instead of directing your, using your printing press to feed the banks and underwrite the banks, you're using it for a productive purpose in the, is in the local economy. We could uh, pay, we could allow individual depositors to deposit at the central bank, uh, which has been proposed. It's proposed that we, or actually they're working on this, that they will have a digital currency, so that will expand the amount of money that's actually created by the central bank and that individuals could deposit at, this, at the central bank, which means we could get, be getting 2% on our deposits, and it would be totally safe. And you wouldn't have this need for the repo market that um, big investors like pension funds put their money in because they, don't ha they aren't within that $250,000 insurance limit. You wouldn't, need, you wouldn't need an FDIC insurance limit. You wouldn't need FDIC insurance because the central bank cannot go bankrupt. Um, and all that, to me, just requires a reconceptualization of what money is and what banking is. Banks are just creating the money on their books. We could just be going directly to the source and be monetizing our own promise to pay. I, I discussed this more fully yesterday. Uh, <clears throat> and another thing that I think would be really interesting that the central bank could do would be to buy up some relevant companies that are giving us problems. For example, I can imagine buying up Amazon and what you would basically have is a big community currency where it would be a public institution. You could sell your goods and um, into, the, into the public Amazon or public eBay and get currency that, that then you could spend in the whole system, but the, the profits would go back to the public. Or by um, PG, uh, Pacific Gas and Electric, which is now bankrupt, and the stock is down to $4 a share, it would be very cheap for the state. I mean, it's been proposed that the state should buy the stock. But the problem is the state will then have to take on all these liabilities because all these homeowners who have been, their homes have been burned, are suing uh, PG&E. But it, the, if you had the deep pocket of the central bank backing it, it wouldn't matter. They could pay off. They, those people should be compensated. And we could absorb that cost because we need more money in the, in the economy anyway. It's also been proposed that we buy up the big oil companies, and that will kind of get them out of you know, prevent them from being in the way of the various legislation that we need, assuming you want to change over to have a change in your fuels. So those are, those are just some possibilities, um, which I think are exciting. So for a sustainable environment, we need a sustainable money system and quoting to borrowing from the next seven quote uh, from Buck, Buckminster Fuller. You never change things by fighting the existing re reality. To change something, create a new model that makes the old model obsolete. So that's all I've got. Those are my books and my websites for more information. Thank you very much. Any questions? I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about um, like what the difference of like co-ops, local banks, versus these national banks. Just
just like kind of on a smaller level. Say it, say it again, co -ops. Oh, like, yeah, I mean, I'm just, I don't really know the difference of, like, co-ops versus, like, local banks versus, like, just kind of on a smaller level, even if the whole system doesn't change, um, kind of, where do those things fall in as far as being more or less? Okay, a, a credit union is a cooperative bank, basically, and it's owned by its members, but it's still private. It's, credit unions are very circumscribed in what they can do. The big banks have made sure that they can't do very much, so there's a limited amount of the size of the loans they can make. They are not set up to handle a city or a state um, banking business, which would just be too big, and it, you know they're just not allowed to do it. But also, they're just privately owned. So what we're talking about is the public using the public's monies for the public benefit. So it's the whole public. It wouldn't just be a limited group of people. But a credit union is a very good place to put your own individual deposits. You know, I totally approve of the model, but it's just we're talking about something different with public banks here. So I'm wondering, what are the obstacles now to bringing this to other states? And uh, what strategies are you pursuing? Well, um, we're, we're, the Public Banking Institute is a 501c3, so for, for us it's just all about information. We do, I write books and I write a lot of articles and we've got a website that's got all the legislation and we do a newsletter every week, all that kind of stuff. So, but that the, there are these local groups that we meet with and you know, every, every month we have conference calls or Zoom calls with people from all across the country. Uh, and we say, you know, they share ideas and share what obstacles they've come up with. And the California Public Banking Alliance is now discussing uh, expanding to be a national organization that would help more with political, you know, the political angle. We're not allowed to do political stuff or actually promote legis specific legislation. But they would, they would be doing like coaching other states in how to approach it. They were so successful. It was amazing. And it's, you know, it's just this push of millennials and the legislators listen to the millennials because they know that that's the ne they're the next wave of voters. So. Well, it seems to me that the, the private banks would not want this. It would mean that their profits and already we just said they've controlled the credit union's um, abilities to do certain things in banking. So it seems to me that would be a natural enemy of the process. Yeah, they, they, we do definitely get pushback. And they did too in Sacramento with this latest bill. But uh, I mean, I heard different stories. I wasn't up there. but um, So they would have like one banking lobbyist, high, highly paid banking lobbyist, come out of the legislator's office and 25 young people would troop in with their t-shirts and their <laughs> signs and they're just their, the, uh, their enthusiasm or their, anyway, the, and the, the young people went out. It's not all young people. There were some oldsters from, you know, Public Banking Institute people that, that had been through the ropes and knew the offices in Sacramento and all that stuff, but it was a good combination. The troops have arrived. That's what I keep saying. <laughs> yes. So in order to take advantage of the public bank, Sorry? In order to take advantage of a public bank uh, for a loan, you would have to live in that state, is that correct? Um, it, it, it still, again, it depends on how you want to set up your bank. It, it's, it, we're just following the, the, mo the, the model that we have right now, the Bank of North Dakota, that would be true. But you could, you could redesign it. You could design it some other way if you wanted. Are there any other sources of pushback? Besides private banks? Well, the, um, politicians themselves, or particularly like bureaucrats, are very protective of their jobs and they don't want to rock the boat and their job is to be all worried about risk. You know, they, any, if things go wrong, it's going to be their fault. Let's say treasurers. Treasurers often object to this model because it's their job to handle the money and what's it mean if it's going to go into a bank that they maybe have less control over? So, yeah, we get a lot of, but there, like I just did a debate with a treasurer in San Diego and um, it was pretty easy. I mean, her objection, well, the AB 857, they put in so many um, 
continue. There are so many hurdles that we have to jump over. Once we get over all those hurdles, it's going to be the safest bank in the state. One more question about education and business schools and such. Do you see uh, this idea tossed around and say, you know, the Stanford, Harvard, the Ivy League business schools, um, or they just by? Um, we have professors that that are, you know, talk about public banking, but I'm not thinking of anyone from Harvard specifically. <laughs> not yet. In the movie Tomorrow that we saw, there was a little section on towns that were offering local currency that could only be used in the town to keep money in the town. Is the making of that money just basically going to a printing press and making the money? How, how, how does the town make um, Well, community currencies traditionally have been printed pieces of paper, but they, but they are still a token for some good or service is being, has been traded in order to acquire the money, unless you, you, usually you have to buy it with dollars, and then it trades, and then you, so that, so that really defeats the purpose. You're not really expanding the money supply. Um, but if it's now they have digital currencies that are, you know, all computerized and that they have a larger reach. So I think with the, like I'm, the reason I'm thinking Amazon is you get the, you can't really do a very big community currency because you can only make it as big as the community that you can know and trust. If you, if you don't know where to find these people and they send you a product or whatever, you're not necessarily going to... You, there's nobody to sue if you didn't get the product you wanted. But uh, like with Amazon, you've got 100 reviews, and so at least you, there's some, some way to check the reputation of the per person that sells into the system. And it, a regular bank or a credit card company actually will give you your money back if you can demonstrate that it was a fraud or something. Or Amazon will give you your money back if, you know, you can, you can argue about it. You've got, I mean, I think there's something to be said for centralization. The problem with just uh, the ordinary old-fashioned local currency was that it wasn't real trustworthy. You, you couldn't be sure of what you were getting, and you couldn't be sure that people would pay up. Like, maybe they would be giving credit for, maybe you were allowed to use your credit up to $100, let's say. Well, what if everybody in the, in the community used $100 in credit and then they just abandoned the whole project? <laughs> I mean, there's, the, there's no way to make them. People would just drift away from the community or whatever and wouldn't have paid their tab. So there's, a lot, there's something to be said for a, a real organization where you've got the court system behind you and the government that can enforce these things. So. Thank you. Um, so people have been asking about what the natural enemies of this model is. I'm thinking what are the natural allies for public banking and how, given the question yeah. that you asked at the beginning, can this pay for the changes that we aspire to? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Well, the local public banks are somewhat limited. I mean, they could definitely pay for more than you're going to get out of a private bank, and they would be more interested in that type of loan. But I really think for the big, big things that they're thinking about in transforming the whole global economy, we really need the central bank. Somehow we've got to commandeer the actual power to create money, because we need more money out there. And, and uh, what a private bank can do, I mean, it can, it does create money on its books, but then the loans are paid back. It can't do quantitative easing where it just pumps money out there and leaves it out there like, like you would probably need to do for a universal basic income, because who's going to pay it back? It's either, it's either you create the money and leave it out there, or the taxpayers pay, pay it back, and taxpayers are probably not going to vote for that, especially the taxpayers that are in control of Congress, <laughs> the big money people. <laughs> Yeah, mine was actually along that line. I was wondering if um, like politicians in North Dakota specifically are kind of allies of what you're trying to do in California, which seems like a kind of an unusual potential alliance. 
Yeah, well, th that's it's really it's interesting that the Bank of North Dakota that North Dakota is such a conservative state. I mean, we use that all the time. We say, "See, it's a Republican state. It's not a socialist institution. It's about sovereignty. It's about keeping our money in the state and using it for our own purposes." Any other questions? Yeah. I um, is there like I haven't looked at the obviously the website, but is there like a cliff notes or something on the website? Like if I were to call my state legislature and say, you know, you should consider this, and I you could say, well, tell me more. I can't. I kind of got what you said, but I couldn't. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of information on the website, and there are tools, yeah, for people approaching their legislation. Sorry, say that again. Calling digital money cryptocurrency is that? No. Th what um, I mean, what the Fed is talking about is a digital currency, but it wouldn't be a crypto. I mean, they know they would know everything about us. You know, it's just like your basic bank account. But right now, the only money that, well, the Fed prints those paper dollars, but the, those don't go very far. And people don't, they're not as convenient as digital money. You know, everybody's using digital money these days. And so they use their cards or they use their bank. Um, so the Fed wants to get in there and actually issue US dollars in a digital form. And that's what they're talking about. Right now, there's two banking systems. There's the system that the banks use. And that's like real money. I mean, that's actual government issue or Federal Reserve issued money. But the money only goes into the reserve accounts of banks. It can't jump that divide over into, into the private market, except for paper dollars and, and coins, which are a very limited. People don't use them that much. So the Fed wants to get expand the amount of money that's issued by the government, which is good. But then it seems to me we've got to take back the Fed, because right now what the Fed does is not the government. So cryptocurrency, you don't believe in? Um, well, I think I don't, you couldn't do a blockchain, a real blockchain, as a national currency. I mean, the Chinese say that, that the amount of trades that happen every day in the U.S. dollar would make it so slow, so expensive, and very environmentally unfriendly. Um, so you couldn't do it. But, but black, uh, say Bitcoin is just like gold. I mean, it's a good investment in trying times. It's... I guess I don't have any myself, but I mean I wouldn't necessarily argue that it. Obviously, if you got in at the right time, it was a very good investment, but it just won't work for for a national currency used for everyday trade. Yeah. So, I'm wondering, do you see this as a parallel system to the Fed and the private banks, or somehow would they intersect? What would be the ideal? Uh, well, one objection to opening the Fed up to private or to us is that everybody would rush to the Fed. We'd all want this safe banking account that paid us 2% interest. And so all the deposits would be pulled out of the, the private banks, and they would not have the liquidity to cover their loans. And then, therefore, it would dry up the lending market. But it seems to me. Once you realize, I mean, they don't have the liquidity anyway. They, they're always borrowing from each other overnight, and then they give it back in the morning. So once you figure that out, that the whole thing is a fraud in the first place, let's just acknowledge that the money is just turning credit into something you could spend in the marketplace, and you need a guarantor. And you're better off with a public guarantor than a private guarantor. So we're just drawing from the deep well of the public liquidity Anyway, it seems to me that we could be borrowing directly from the Fed, but that doesn't mean we want the Fed to be in charge of all these loans, which they wouldn't have the capacity to do even if they wanted to, but you could have a network of public banks that would, that would do that, and they would just draw from this well. And that, that is one of our big barriers in setting up local public banks, is that where do we find the capital, and then we try to go to... You know, we say, well, you've got money over here, money over here. I mean, there's all kinds of money floating around in the comprehensive annual financial reports that you could find that states and cities have, but they always say, well, this is allocated for that, or you can't use that, or, you know, there's all, we could just be drawing from the, from the top. So really all the bank does is 
guarantee these loans. And if a few of them go bad, I mean, you, you put good loan officers on there that make the best loans they can. You know, they look into it and they say, well, that looks like a good loan. And if it defaults, just write it off. It won't hurt anything to write off these loans because you only created them on the books in the first place. Yeah. Do you have anything that you could say about the student loans that are floating around right now that are supposed to be forgiven but have not been given? What's the state of all that money? Oh, sorry. I hadn't heard there were ones that were to be forgiven. Well, yeah. well the debt forgiveness program is a lot of programs. But they're, they're not honoring it. So the debt forgiveness program was started for people who stayed in like public service oh. for like say 10 years and they paid their oh, right, right. loans back on time. But then if you actually go, I went through the process and then I read an article recently that said that they were really, they were really not doing it. They're just, that's, is that what you're referring to? Like with yes. nurses, they've already run out of money and certain, like in my state or whatever to pay up any more loans this year. Mm -hmm. They just yeah. kind of, they'll do a little bit with it just, from what you're saying, it doesn't make any sense to me. Who's running out of the money? If, if all of this is kind of mystical stuff, it's not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it could be, but that's the thing. We've got these rules that say you've got to get the money somewhere. But that's what I'm saying. You don't need to get the money somewhere. Create the money, and it's not going to hurt anything. Most of your loans are going to be productive, and they will get paid back. And in fact, you know, if you, I'm not opposed to interest, but the interest should go back to the people for public purposes, it seems to me. But if they, you know, so they, they're paid back with interest, and that will cover a few defaults. And if there's more defaults than that, it's still not going to hurt anything. We need that extra money out there in the system. But that's, so that's what I think is, you know, if we're talking about the next system, that's what I think the future banking system should look like, but it's not the way it is right now. I mean, right now they're forced to balance their books, and if they don't have the money, they've got to worry about their credit rating and, you know, all those things. The Fed makes them, they've increased all their capital requirements and their deposit requirements after 20, 2008. Yeah. <laughs> I was just curious, it sounded like you said in China sometimes it happens. Do you know of any other like modern day examples of debt jubilees? Like, is that is that something that uh, have any of the, like, the other public banking programs or systems? Uh, I think the Indian banks also have a lot of defaults. I don't, I'm not sure what they do with them. I, I particularly study China because, you know, it's our big alleged rival. And it seems to me instead of trying to break them at the knees, we should copy what they do. Like, good idea. that Like, they stole our ideas for technology. Why don't we steal their ideas for banking or for how to fund our businesses? Sorry? Do you think Trump would get off of that? Yeah, if, any, if anybody has his ear, let me know. <laughs> I'm not a, a, you know. Hmm. Sorry? He can just steal it, call it his idea. And then... <laughs> yeah, maybe I should frame it like that. We should steal his idea. Okay, I guess that's all. Um, thank you very much.